Okay, we are recording. Um, yeah, so Trent, I see you shared the agenda. Um, one thing you also you mentioned is that a couple of teams have like mockups and whatnot that they've been working on and I think they've shared with you. Um, I don't know if it maybe makes sense for like teams who've actually like prototype stuff to maybe take five minutes or 10 minutes to walk us through it. Um, I feel like that might be a good way to set the context. Um, I don't know if, you know, now that it's recorded, that changes things. Um, otherwise, we can, we can kind of go through the agenda or just like the questions that people had. Um, but yeah, I feel like it, if a team kind of wants to walk through what they've thought about so far and, and how they, they've kind of approached things that might be useful to make it a bit more concrete than uh, yeah, just talking in the abstract. Yeah, um, no, I think that'd be great. And I think we have two mock-ups from Jake and Carl. I, I think I've, I know I mentioned it to Carl, but Jake, I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if you wouldn't mind just walking us through what your team has put together so far, I think that, yeah, that would be a good way to start. Yeah, for sure. Uh, should I start? Yeah, let's yeah, do it. Yeah. Yeah. And sh share your screen if you have it pulled up, or I can share mm -hmm. it. No, I got it right here. Just give me one second. All right. So, so yeah, we have, we've had a lot of conversations. This is, this is very much a rough draft. Um, we're, we're hoping to do some user testing really soon, probably by the end of this week. So we'll probably, probably be iterating. Um, there's probably a lot of things that are going to change or things that don't make sense. Um, but here's where we're at. Uh, so the scenario, this is sort of a stripped out view just to keep it simple. The scenario is focused on uh, swaps. So we're showing Uniswap here. Um, uh, some of the, like, we're, we're thinking about what changes in different network conditions if, if traffic is increasing versus decreasing. So this scenario is kind of focused on an increasing, uh, increasing traffic. So we're sort of uh, estimating that fees are going to be going up. There's a little bit of a wider range. Um, so you go through, you hit swap on Uniswap. This is the revised transaction screen. So there's really only two pieces we've, we've changed. Um, we're calling it an estimated gas fee. This is what we expect you to pay. Um, and then there is a range. Um, so that range would be if, um, you know, if the network uh, traffic didn't continue in the direction we did, maybe it's a little bit less. And then the top end would be sort of your, your max fee. And then down here, we're showing the total. We're highlighting the estimated amount. Um, I think a lot of that's going to depend on how confident we feel about that number. We don't want to show a number and then pay something else. But we feel confident about it, showing, highlighting that number and then showing it up too. And then if you hit edit, that brings you over into the edit view. Um, the, the, the way we're thinking about it now is trying to shift focus from speed and more towards um, like purpose, like what type of transaction are you doing? And then what, how much should you be paying based on that? So some, we're going to have to have a good fallback. So we're not always going to know that scenario of what somebody's doing. But our hope is um, we can you know, sort of understand what they're doing. So in this case, they're doing a swap. Um, and then we'd be recommending a, a higher setting since it's time sensitive. Um, so we have high, medium, low, and um, I can dig into more details about some of these numbers if that makes sense, but I'll just kind of skip over that for now. Um, and then if they override that, just trying to inform them, hey, maybe that's, not, maybe that's not a good idea. We're still allowing them to do it. But part of it is just like education on what setting you should be uh, picking. And so you're not just setting it to low every time. And... Then we have advanced. We've spent less time on the advanced, um, but here's where it is now. Um, your gas limit, max tip per gas, max price per gas. I still think there's some room to improve this a little bit, specifically between how the max tip uh, rolls into the, the max price. I don't know if it's very intuitive here, but uh, we are going to need some error states. We just have one showing here, but there's definitely going to have to be some more thought on how we um, talk about this to the user if they're, if they're putting weird settings in. Uh, so we're showing some of those stats that we have in the main screen. So the fee range, the estimated fee, uh, wait time. I'm, I'm just kind of putting in numbers here right now. I'm not sure exactly how big those swings are going to be, but the idea is uh, the lower your fee is, um, at some point, we're just going to have to say unknown. Like we're not sure when it's actually going to process. Um, so I can pause there. There's some more thought in the, the actual numbers, but a lot, a lot of them I'm just kind of making up for the time being, uh, stress testing the designs, but I'll, I'll pause there. 
Awesome, this is really helpful to have. Um, does anybody have any initial questions or things that they want a clarification on? Um, are you, is there, is like the lag of the updating, um, like some, like every 20 or 30 seconds to like update those two ranges? Yeah, absolutely. That's one thing that we haven't tackled yet. And to be honest, we haven't, like, it's been in my head. We haven't actually talked about it, but this will, I mean, it will have to update pretty quickly. Um, and that's something we definitely need to take consideration in, especially on this screen, right? If you open this up and you just sit here and it's just like quietly updating and maybe you're not really paying attention. So I think we're going to have to put some animation or some fade in, some fade out, something to make that a little bit more obvious. The, yeah, how we estimate the range, like we could potentially like pad it a little bit. So there's a, a wider window where those numbers are, uh, where those numbers make sense. But at the same time, it's like a balancing act. We don't want to show too big of a range. Um, so it's still, still a bridge to be crossed. Are you going to allow people to submit legacy transactions? I'm not sure there's a use case for it, but um, they'll still be possible on the network. Yep, totally. Okay. Um, yeah, this is really cool. Uh, one question. Do you somehow detect if the current base fee on the network is really high and alert the user somehow? Or you always get uh, send the maximum fee that's greater than the current base fee without alerting the user? Yeah, that's a good question. We did, in some of our earlier mocks, we did do a little bit more messaging around like the, the current network status, right? Like, hey, it's it's really it's really busy right now. Like, fees are really high. Um, we did consider um, like um, like sort of prompting people to add a, a, a lower, uh, lower max fee and waiting for it or, you know, running the risk of it. So that's not shown in these mocks. Like, we're not testing that. Um, I think we're kind of trying to strip it down to MVP, but that is certainly something that I think is worth worth considering. Um, yeah, and if if that feels important, I might circle back and and bring those back into the mockups. Uh, yeah, there's a comment about like, uh, should we allow opt out at the user level to send legacy? Like, I think it might make sense to preserve that, but like, there's no. The, the main advantage of sending legacy transactions for the users is the fact that it's like, if 1559 is not supported, say they use, I don't know, like Ledger and Ledger doesn't update, uh, we want the network to be able to have their transaction or say they signed a transaction a year ago, right? They've been waiting to broadcast it for a year and they threw out, you know, whatever thing they used to sign it. Uh, we want them to still be able to send it. So I, you know, I don't see a like use case for like allowing users to like never like to not have 1559 transactions as a default, but there might be some weird edge cases where like in the advanced settings, you want somebody to be able to dig up and, and send a, a legacy transaction. Um, but if you're like constructing the transaction on behalf of your users, there's not really a good reason to send a legacy transaction because that means they're just gonna pay more gas. They won't get a refund. Uh, but like they won't get the difference between like their fee cap and the base fee that tip refunded to them. Uh, that all goes to the miner. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've been talking about like keeping the old UI experience around for networks that don't support EIP 1559, oh. et cetera. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's the, the uh, yeah. So for, yeah, for sure. If you're obviously supporting like Ethereum Classic uh, or, you know, like XDAI and like they haven't integrated yet and whatnot, like, um, yeah you'll need to keep the, the old UI. Uh, one question that we have, and maybe if we have time at the end of the call after we get through some of the, the UX stuff is just how do we detect support? I know there's like an ETH Magicians forum thread that Dan Finley had opened about this, but uh, yeah. Yeah, the short answer to there. Uh, so there was a, a thread in the agenda about that. I think at this point, the like easiest way is you look at the block header and see if there's a base fee in it. Um, unfortunately, there's no way to know that like a network will support something in the future. So you can't like say we, we announced the fork, you know, tomorrow, you can't like look at mainnet and know that 1559 is going to like happen on fork block X. Um, but once the fork block passes, uh, the base fee, the, every single block will have a base fee. Um, so that's probably like the most, uh, reliable way to check it. Well, cool, thanks. Um, 
Cool. Anything else on the MetaMask marks? And Trent, I believe you said there was another team that had sent. Yeah, I let me. I think Carl is here from Status. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I'll start sharing now. Great. Um, okay, can everybody see? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so trying to keep things initially as close to um, what exists now, rather than giving people ranges of fees when they're when they're choosing the priority, uh, which only showing them the maximum that they're going to be paying for that transaction. Um, and then kind of behind this, we do have all of the custom, uh, all of the customs stuff. So we're giving them information about the current base fee, the gas limit, per gas tip limit and per gas price limit. Um, and then calculating the, the maximum fee um, but as a part of this, there are then a set of edge cases that, that we need to kind of handle and watch for. Um, so if the, if the uh, user sets a tip that is below the currently ac accepted tip, then we're showing them a warning around the, the minimum tip of the last N or last X blocks and the average tip that is being given to the miners. Um, if it's above the minimum, but below their average here, we're giving them information about that. Um, if it's below the current, if the per gas price limit is below the current base fee, then again, that is going to, to we, we can guess that it's gonna block that transaction um, initially anyway. Um, if I go ahead a little bit further, um, and then there are a, an additional set of um, edge cases where if somebody sets a, a, uh, a base fee that is, um, that is <laughs> above the current base fee, but lower than the, the current tip, then again, we can assume that that transaction won't be uh, accepted initially, and then again an edge case for for uh, for when the calculated tip is going to be below that average. Um, so there are lots of more edge cases here that we need to be watching for, um, and that the, all all of these edge cases then feed into the actual kind of simple interface where somebody just has a scale, um, because. On that scale, honestly, we have no idea what these ranges should be. Um, we don't know, for example, uh, what the what the overall limit should be above the current base fee, taking into account the tip. Should it be uh, one GUI or should it be like ten GUI over that? We we don't really know. Um, and then, if I just go a little bit further, um, if if uh, the base fee plus tip is going to be below uh, the current base fee plus tip, then uh, we introduce some extra friction in this transaction to basically get the person to either go change the tip or change the limit. Um, and then, yeah, there are also kind of combinations of these edge cases as well. So if the tip is too low, and, um, oh, sorry, I'm reminding myself of, of these screens as I'm running through them. If the tip is too low and the, the overall limit is too low, um, then we need to also show them information about what is happening in those specific situations. Um, and then I guess the most helpful part of this would be, yeah, um, these are the, the edge cases that we're looking for inside that custom fee interface. Um, with regards to rollout, uh, we had a discussion about this earlier today. Um, and uh, after reviewing the, the document around how it's going to be released and uh, kind of initially having the one queue base fee and still having the auction mechanism, we at least 
imagine that keeping the current gas interface is going to be the best thing to do for the initial, let's just say, uh, 50 blocks, um, and then switching to this um, to, to this new interface. But really, we don't really know what, what is going to be best on day one or from the first block onwards. Uh, we're very much just kind of throwing ideas out there at the moment and seeing what will work. Uh, but yeah, I'll go back to the screens. And if anybody has any questions, uh, happy to happy to jump in. Um, hi, hi, um, Samuel here. Um, th thanks for this. I was wondering, um, since like you know, there's a lot of path dependencies and different options are unknown, do you have any plans to A/B test this to your users, or would it be a big bang? So, um, what, what we, well, at least what I imagine us doing is um, basically being on call when this goes live. Ideally, we chatted about this today as well, is we'd have a test room uh, to make sure that all of this is going to work. Uh, we, we're not in a, in a position to A-B test this interface against the current interface because it is going to go live and we need to accommodate for it. Uh, we, can't, we can't have the, the, the current gas interface tested against the new interface just because the, the, the current gas interface doesn't, um, doesn't like c cover all of the parameters that, that, that people can manage themselves. Um, that being said, somebody mentioned earlier uh, being able to switch the interface to use the uh, current gas format. And I think that is something that we don't have in here. And that's something that we probably should have in here. Uh, but yeah, A-B testing, I don't think we're in a position to do that with this. I think one thing maybe we could help organize is um, just user testing for people on once the test nets start to pour. Um, we could probably get you some people to just start poking around and looking at things. And that's, I think we could try to do it for most teams, um, but no promises. Yeah, yeah, that'd be, that would be really helpful. Uh, we are going to run through this, uh, make sure that everything's usable and uh, make sure that people understand what is happening um, after we've got a initial um, a, uh, build ready. Um, and but, but the main things that I imagine is changing are going to be the, the, the copy that we're using in these edge cases. What we still don't know are, um, if I go here, um, we don't know how to estimate um, the priority fee. So what is low priority? What is high priority? We, we still need to figure out that part of it. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure how we're, <laughs> how we're gonna do that. That, that isn't really a, um, something that I'm, I, I'm qualified to talk about, but um, yeah, I think it's big unknown until we start to learn after, after it goes live. So we have some values. I don't know if you saw the cheat sheet that Trent and I put together. I, we have like some rough values uh, for the priority fee uh, that, that, that we've used. So basically the, the challenge for the priority fee is you want to compensate miners enough that they, you know, it's worth it for them to add their transaction. And the more transaction miners add in the block, the higher the risk of being uncalled is. Um, and this used to be quite simple to calculate, but now uh, a large part of the uncle risk is MEV bundles. So if a miner has an MEV transaction in their block, that's like a high value time sensitive transaction. So that the cost of um, the, the opportunity cost of these transactions is, is, is much uh, higher. Um, so in the in the cheat sheet, you can see there's like a, a graph basically that shows like a linear relationship between like what the average MEV in a block is and uh, you know what should the tip be. Um, Flashbots has a dashboard that kind of tracks this over time. Uh, there's no great like uh, library, right? Like there's no great way to like plug in that dashboard um, in in wallets, um, but. 
you know, if you want like a ballpark value to start, what I would do is like looking at the flashback dashboard, you know, a week or two before the EAP goes live. And you just kind of, you can kind of ballpark, you know, like what's the average MEV in blocks uh, then? And, and then, you know, you can go back to the graph and, and figure out like what's like the right tip. Right now, that value would be about two way. Um, but they've, anyways, Flashbot rolled up a bunch of optimizations that will allow for more MEV in each block. So I suspect by the time it goes live, like a decent tip for most transactions is probably going to be like three GUE. Um, again, subject to like how that the MEV evolves. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the MEV stuff is another, like I haven't really touched on that, but um, yeah. that, that was honestly a big unknown, like how MEV would interact with this and, and, yeah. and, yeah. and, and what, that, what that baseline tip should be. So that's really yeah. helpful, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, like looking at it, you know, if, if you can be like fancier, like I'm just taking like an average, right? But if mm -hmm. if you're like a wallet and you want to be a bit fancier, you could say maybe your fast transaction should be worth it for a miner to include, you know, in like the 95th percentile of like MEV blocks, right? And then yeah. maybe your optimal is like the average and you're slow. Um, there's also, I think right now, there's only like a, something like 30 or 40% of blocks that have MEVs. So you're slow, you can probably set like a tip to like two GUI, which, or I forget if it's one or two GUI, it, it says it in the spreadsheet, but that'll compensate basically for blocks with zero MEV. So your slow can basically just be, you know, you're waiting until there's a block that doesn't have MEV in it, which, you know, on average should be two, three blocks. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah. I agree, it does complicate things a lot. Well, so there's that, and there's also the base fee. Whether that base, fee, I mean, I know we can determine whether the base fee is going to go up or down based on activity, but also, I we then need to make a call on what a low priority base fee is going to be versus a high yes. priority base fee, um, and. And then hopefully in the future, we can estimate time based on that. But there are so many variables and so many moving parts that it's really difficult. Yeah. I, I can't right now say, OK, we know what is going to happen ahead of time. Um, so this is very much kind of the absolute minimum that we can do initially to cover for yeah. like the parameters and, and everything that's required as a part of it. And then hopefully in the future, we can introduce estimation on time. Um, yeah, yeah, just because there's so much, so many different things uh, to 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 yeah. include. Yeah, and I think having on-chain data, like you know, like even like a few weeks of on-chain yeah. data, will be massively cool. useful to see what you know what the right defaults yeah. are. Um, yeah, if you, I don't know how much like you know tracking you do of like user data, but if you're able to yeah. see like these transaction failed or you know got got stuck pending and and whatnot, like. But the, the, so that's a situation that um, I'm a little bit nervous about. Um, and that would be, let's just say, day one, there's suddenly um, high congestion, lots of people are trying to transact, and uh, you essentially have a bidding war then between yes. these different wallets. Um, yes. And what I, I did. Like on the status side, we don't want to be in a situation where our estimation is totally off and nobody can get a transaction through from, from status yes. use it, using yes. the, the simple interface. Um, and yeah, I, I guess that's for us to figure out. But um, <laughs> yeah, and I think that's that's a really good yeah, that. that's a really good point. So um, on this, so this was like the last thing I put in on like the cheat sheet, but. Um, when 1559 goes live, the base fee is actually set to one GUI, um, which is yeah. tiny. Um, so that means there will be a period where like blocks will be full just because you know there, there will be this bidding war. Um, so I suspect the easiest way for wallets to uh, get around that is to actually wait to display the 1559 UI. Um, and you basically want to wait until like blocks are not like completely full again. Um, and I, you know, I had some rough like ballpark numbers there. It's probably something like, uh, you know, 15, 30-ish minutes. Um, and I had like some yeah. better criteria, but like, so I think once you have that initial spike, you'll probably get to a spot where like, yeah, you are not, you are no longer in like a bidding war and like prices are stabilized. And so the 1559 UI should work. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So when yeah, at the start of the call, I mentioned we're gonna possibly keep the current interface or the or the current estimation interface for the first 50 blocks and yeah. then switch. Um hopefully that keeps things simple, but obviously want to yeah. double check that um that, that sounds yeah. right with everybody here. Yeah. So the trade-off there is if you leave it just too long, you know, users might overpay slightly on their transactions. So I think, you know, yeah. you could say like, you want to be really safe and you put it for a hundred blocks. So that means for like those, you know, second 50 blocks, maybe your users are overpaying a little bit, but they're not, you know, potentially getting their transactions stuck. So I think that's just like the, yeah, the trade-off you, like every wallet basically needs to figure out. Yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, we're almost like halfway through the call. Um, we did have like a bunch of topics on the agenda, but I don't know if just to make it like as useful as possible, are there like urgent questions or, or things that, you know, people here really wanted to bring up? Otherwise we can run through the, the different topics, but yeah. Um, um, I guess I had a question. Uh, so I assume most people are relying on gas APIs right now. Uh, just to determine kind of what the best price is. And there's various APIs. Um, I know that the wallets are on this call. I was wondering if you guys were having conversations with uh, these various gas APIs to help provide uh, estimations for, for tip calculations when it gets to the point where we need to start bidding <laughs> again against each other um, or like if there are plans for that. Does that, does that make sense? Is, maybe yeah, I'm, I know, I know um, <laughs> ETH gas station is on the call. Um, so they're thinking about how they're going to treat this. I don't know if okay. there are other ones you had in mind. Okay, cool. Yeah, I guess like the EtherScan API also has. EtherScan is here too. Yeah, maybe. Okay, perfect. Um, who's here from? Is it Harith from EtherScan? If you want to talk about what you're working on at all or what your approach is. Uh, to be honest, we don't really have a. a Clear approach uh, right now. So, if anyone who potentially uh, will rely on, on our API have any um, suggestions or any um, comments, um, happy to happy to hear that. And I think Barnabé had like done a bit of work looking at like how oracles should adapt after fifteen fifty nine. Uh, so, I, I don't know. Maybe Barnabé, there's like a few things you can share either here or after the call. Um, yeah, that can be helpful. Sure. I mean, so first the thing to remember is, well, we don't have data yet, but there is a very strong intuition that um, these bidding wars, they will be very infrequent. And when they do happen, they will be very short lived because the, if there's a lot of pressure, base fee raises and that's, after some point it kind of stabilizes the system. So the role of the oracles to give you the tip is very different. Like the oracles as they exist right now, they do this very long historical kind of analysis, the last 200 blocks of data. Um, here, I don't actually think it's necessary. First, I think it's good enough to look at the five, 10 latest blocks and kind of look at the median fee, how people are, let's say, overbidding each other. You don't need, I think, the complexity that currently exists um, in these if gas station oracles or, or any other oracle. You might it might be useful to have something where you actually see the pending transactions and you can see what people are currently planning to tip. Uh, but apart from that, I, I feel that, yeah, oracles in under 1559, they really don't serve the, the same purpose as they used to. And my point about oracles was more that these legacy users who maybe use outdated software, um, if they still rely on oracles, the oracles will start very much converging towards the, the current value of base fee. And that makes it a pretty bad estimation for users who are still um, using legacy transactions. But, um, but otherwise, I, I think oracles should either be yeah, sunset or, or very much like refold from, from scratch into the 1559 environment. Just to be clear, we're talking about off-chain uh, APIs, not on-chain oracles. Yeah, that's correct. But okay. at, at this point, it seems very much less sophisticated 
on chain by on chain i really mean like the wallet itself could just keep in mind the last five ten blocks and make the estimation itself i feel that might be good enough for one five five nine and you wouldn't need all the machinery that exists in the current of chain oracles that we have today okay thanks for those that overview um Samuel, I'll try to find a link for you. Uh, to, I think Barnabé has done some research. He has a big body of work on this stuff. Yeah, I'm looking through Barnabé's notebooks repo right now, but there's like 20 of them. So, uh, yeah. If it, yeah, I remember Barnabé, you had one kind of walking through the oracles and how like the data from even, like how the data from the 1559 usage could even help set better oracles for like the, the legacy transactions. Um, I just have no idea which notebook that is. Oh, I can share the link. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. The main, yeah. I guess right now transactions they have very wide range, even within blocks. And so oracles, they we, they they quote like the slow versus medium versus fast. They, there can be like a very large variance between the three different levels. And I don't think we'll see that in one five five nine because by the nature of a mechanism, which is like this base fee that everyone is paying plus a premium that everybody pretty much pays the same, you should find that your records start converging to, to, to a good enough value. Um, yeah, I'll share the link in the, in the chat. Um, and for the people asking about gas now, I've had some difficulty communicating with them or just like getting them on board with this stuff. Not that they're not interested, but I think they're just doing other things. So if anybody has like a existing uh, line of communication with them and you can tell them to talk to me or connect us in some way that would be really helpful. Cool. Uh, one, one thing I was, I was wondering is, uh, it feels like uh, pretty much everyone is on the same page that from now on, uh, most of the estimation side uh, will be on the, on the wallet side, right? Uh, just looking at the, at the latest blog. Uh, I feel like, uh, that's kind of okay, but at the same time, it will be cool if uh, any API like Etherscan or wh whatever could provide that estimation as an API do. Because uh, polling blocks is fine, but at the same time is uh, might be a bit uh, in intense or depending on network connections, not everyone has like, you know, uh, perfect Wi-Fi when like, uh, there is more more chances to fail if you have to be polling constantly to know something versus like just uh, fetching one API call to, to uh, an API and just get the number of what you will pay right now. Um, I don't know, just bring it up, could be useful for the apps too. So I don't know, um, something that will be, have, it will be good to have around. And I imagine it would be good if all these APIs follow the same standard yes okay um sorry i'm circling back to what barnabe was mentioning about oracles i understand that all the discussion about gas price oracles for 1559 is around the, the minor tip but does it make sense to also have an oracle for base fee to know if the current base fee is extraordinarily high or something that uh that we are on, on a situation of yeah. congestion I think, yeah, that would also be pretty simple to build, right? Because you just need to look at the gas used, right? If, you know, more than N blocks are full, right? Basically the amount of completely full blocks tells you how high the gas fee is on like an exponential scale. So it's like, if you see, you know, one full block, it's probably not worth it. Two is like pretty high and, you know, like five is like extremely high. So um, yeah, I, I don't know that there's oracles right there, but like, again, it would be pretty straightforward to implement uh, given that, uh, yeah, you just need to look at the, at the gas used. Um, yeah, I think if you observe five blocks full previews, you know that the gas fee is very high because, or at least not very high, but very much there's a very strong demand pressure because otherwise like you couldn't have these double full blocks now that you have like this Slack mechanism. So yeah, five, 
full blocks is definitely like an indication that a lot of people want to transact at the same time. Yeah. And so the challenge there is obviously you don't know how sustained that demand will be, right? Like you, it, it, you can't, you know, if you've seen like five full blocks, uh, you know, you, it's hard to estimate whether or not you'll see five more full blocks or not. Um, but at the very least, you know, you can, you can know that you need to put like a very high tip. You're basically back to a spot where you need to do like a kind of a bidding war on the tip, which is kind of our current system. Um, so that's probably makes sense as a default response or, you know, to tell the user, look, submit this transaction and, you know, it's likely to be, to be pending for a while until, until this, uh, until this, this clears. Yeah. I think we should probably just try and get through the agenda. It's, it's not really, well, I hope it's not a ton of things, but we should probably just go through it quick and then we can get back to open discussion. Sure. Um, I guess, yeah, okay, so the first stuff was the JSON RPC changes. Um, so basically, uh, I th I'd, I'll share the JSON RPC spec in the chat just to make sure everybody has it. Um, but we've added the changes to JSON RPC there. Um, in short, you know, it adds the base fee to the block header and it adds uh, the uh, max fee and max priority fee to the transaction object. Uh, if the transaction is type two, so like a 1559 style transaction. Um, so that should, and, and that's basically the API that the different clients will implement. I think Get has a different version of this and they have an open PR to implement, uh, to implement something in accordance with the spec, but that's kind of, uh, yeah, what all the clients will, will implement in the next couple of weeks. Um, I don't know if there was any questions or comments on that. Um, recommended minimum priority fee. So we touched on this quickly. Um, again, there, I think the, the case where there's not uh, like a, a sudden spike in demand, what you probably want is to just look at the ballpark, you know, average MEV in the last seven days, um, follow Barnabas graph that's linked to that. And you can use that to kind of set the, the default tip. Um, so right now, you know, with the values that we're seeing, we would be around like 1.5 BUE per gas. Um, again, I mentioned earlier, Flashbot is, you know, doing some optimization work to include more bundles. So I suspect by the time 1559 goes live, like two GUE per gas as a default tip probably makes sense to get your transaction included, you know, in like the, like, you know, 75% of blocks, unless it's like extremely high MEV. So just as a default option, um, to GUE as of today is, is, is probably the, the right amount. Um, I'll just run through it. If people have questions, just please interrupt me. Um, transaction replacement. So, okay, so this is something, um, again, Get has an open PR for, um, but the one challenge with 1559 is you can replace transactions kind of costlessly. So if you just raise the fee cap, it doesn't actually mean that the user will end up paying more because you know they just pay the base fee and, and, and the tip. They don't actually pay their entire fee cap. Um, so because of that, uh, it, it could be like a, an attack vector where like people could just stand the transaction pool raising the fee cap you know, every time and it's, it's costless for them to do that. Whereas today, if you, if you raise your gas price on every transaction, obviously you're paying that highest price. Um, so in order to avoid that, I believe uh, what Geth and other clients are gonna go with is you need to raise both the fee cap and the tip by I think 10% uh, for it to be rebroadcasted. Um, so it'll be worth just like looking at like the Geth release notes for that. Um, but roughly if you're, if you're resubmitting your transaction with a higher fee, uh, you want to increase both values, not just the fee cap. Um, yeah. Tim, I've got a question with regards to that. Is this going to be part of the ad protocol or a client? Because people could just jailbreak their clients to take that out and still attack them. Yes, I, uh, just part of the clients. So, like, sure, you can you can uh, you know jailbreak your client to submit the transaction, but then nobody, um, I guess, the client other nodes will not replace the transactions in their transaction pool if they see that it hasn't been raised enough, right? Um, so, and they'll probably just like mark you as a bad peer or something. So 
it's like you can you can obviously hack get and propagate whatever you want on the network but then other nodes will just not update their their status based on that and, and they'll eventually disconnect you does that make sense yes tenfold thank you of course um and then we had London rollout. Um, yeah, we touched on this earlier. I had just added it, um, so we don't need to necessarily go over it again. But like, definitely these. Um, ideally, like you won't need to if you're if you're making the transition properly. Like, regular users who aren't fee sensitive or you know are just sending basic transactions. They don't necessarily they don't always care about the advanced um, gas estimation tools. So ideally, like you've worked out a transition plan, but in in the case of you know a lot of crypto users, they want to know how these advanced features work, and I'm sure everybody's already thinking about this. Like you will need to communicate what all these fields are, and maybe like recommended practices for how to set things during congestion. Um, yeah, this is. I mean, I don't need to tell people this, but it's like I'm, I'm sure you're already thinking of how to communicate this to your users. Yeah, and for the actual kind of UI switch, so we talked about it earlier. You know, I think there's different there's different approaches you can take. Uh, the like easiest and like most naive one is just like adding a blocks buffer between the hard fork and when you turn on the UI. So like you'll know the hard fork block well in advance, and you do like that plus you know 100 or plus 50, and and then you just switch switch it on. If you wanted to actually base it on network condition. Um, one, you know, there's a couple of metrics you can look at. The first is just the gas used in a block. So when we start seeing the gas used um, actually represent like 50% of the gas limit. So right now, you know, the gas limit is 50 million. Um, it'll be 30 million after the fork. So you'd want to check, you know, have I seen like a couple of blocks of the, the gas used being like around 50 million rather than 30 million that's telling you that like we've basically processed all of the transactions you know for a certain base fee and the base fee is now like a good gauge of, of demand on the network um if you want to just look at the base fee you know one way to do that is like maybe just waiting to see like one or two base fees where like the parent's base fee is like you know pretty close to the current base fee. So, you know, whether that's like 5% roughly, it's telling you that like the blocks are, are pretty stable. Um, and um, yeah, if you do want to just go with a number of blocks, I think I would just look at like what the gas price is basically when you're cutting the release for whenever your, your product is going to go live. And then you can calculate, you know, how long does it take to get from one GUI to there if the blocks are full? It increases by 12.5% every block. Um, so when I did the math, it was, I assume, like a 250 GUI, which is obviously higher than the gas price today. Um, and I gave 50 blocks, but you know, you can just look at the blocks whenever your, your release is close. Um, and you know, if if you want to be extra sure, you can like use like a combination of those rules. You know, you can set yourself like maybe a a fairly short block limit, like saying, you know, like 50 blocks since the fork. And, you know, you want the gas used to be between those two ranges before you flip on like the 1559 UI. Um, and I guess what's nice is like all those parameters are just in the block header. So like you don't need to, you don't need to like actually look through like the full block to determine this. Um, so it should be fairly straightforward to, to estimate if you have access to the block header. Um, and if you don't, then I think just like a ballpark number of blocks is probably the, the simplest way to go. And I think that's all we had like on the proper agenda. So, yeah. I mean, while we're here, you might as well just say the last one. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. So ERC editors. Um, okay. So uh, this is not necessarily re related to 1559, but kind of a quick pitch. Um, we are going to be splitting the EIP repo between EIPs and ERCs um, because there's just like such a different skill set from folks working on you know core EIPs and folks working on the, the interface level. Um, if you are interested in helping to be like a potential ERC editor, um, please reach out to Trent or me after the call and, and uh, we can chat about that. But basically it would help, you know, maintain the, the repo, make sure that there's like a good process for people to add new standards and whatnot. Um, 
light client is on the call. He's like a, a EIP editor, so he can maybe also give some context on, on what it's like. Um, but yeah, it's something we're looking for. And I think we're like the application layer can, can really help uh, because you folks have like way more context on ERCs than most of the core devs who are, who are working at, at the protocol level. Cool. Um, the other thing, which is now slipping my mind. Oh, so there was this big conversation on the agenda about like detecting that a network supports 1559. Um, realistically, I think the only way to do that uh, for for now and, and and likely for the next few months will be uh, looking at the looking at the block header, seeing if there's a base fee in there, and if so, that tells you the network is supporting 1559. Oh, okay, I remembered. Um, it's, it sounds like from discussion in the chat and just generally is that we may need to have another call or just coordinate a little bit better with uh, API providers. Um, I know Etherscan is here and ETH gas station, but um, if that is a need and people want us to organize another call, we can do that. I know this was more focused on wallets, but obviously that's very tightly linked to how you're serving data to people. Um, so. Uh, maybe, maybe just after this, I'll reach out to those those teams and see if we need to organize something. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, and then we can just get back to open discussion if people have any questions or comments. Just one, just one uh, um, Second, second that uh, there's chances there's chance not all the users will be created. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty hard, it's hard to. to out. It's pretty hard to hear you, Brendan. Maybe type it in the chat. Or if, or if anybody heard that, um, please translate. Anybody else? Any type of question, go ahead. Yeah, uh, two things basically. Um, the one thing was um, checking um, the block feels a bit brittle to to find out if if um, EIP one five five nine is supported. Is uh, the question is is the train for for London already um, left the station or could there be like a simple EIP in there basically? So it's already done. There is no core EIP <laughs> that will be added to London. And it could be quite a simple one, right? So um, it, just return basically if EIP 15 or in EIP and then in start, start in an optional end block number. So the, the, um, the challenge is that that actually doesn't help for all the networks that don't support it, right? Because it's like, first of all, I don't think we can add any consensus change to London right now, but even if we could. It wouldn't be consensus change, right? It would just be an RPC um, command and extra. So then the RPC basically, the, so I We're guess the, the extra the, RPC yeah. uh, command yeah. basically uh, that returns um, an EIP and an optional start, uh, an start and an optional end number. So like you return, you call like, does this chain support 1559? And it tells you yes or no. Yeah, it would make it more yeah. more general, basically, not just yeah. uh, one five five nine, uh, but basically we will have the same problems in the future. Basically, yeah. It would so the challenge, be... yeah, the the challenge with EIP based. It, the, so the, the the reason this is a hard problem is that clients, at least not all clients, have the concept of like an EIP being activated, especially with mainnet, and that's led to having that concept has led to bugs before. If you can say, you know, I want EIP X, Y, and Z. Um, the, the problem is there's often a lot of interplay between them. And so what clients will do is they won't say, I support an EIP, they'll say, I support a certain hard fork, right? They'll say, I support like London or I support Berlin or whatever. Um, and the, the challenge with that then is like, say Ethereum Classic adds 1559, their hard fork is not gonna be called London. And um, they're, even if, if they, you know, their hard fork is not gonna be called London and it, it might not be the exact same hard fork as 1559. So for example, you know, where in London, we're also changing a bunch of gas costs, uh, or, or sorry, a re refund. But uh, I didn't take it 
for fog, like from the forks, just really from the EIPs, which EIPs are supported from which block? So it would say but one, five, five, the nine. clients don't know. So the clients themselves don't keep track of which EIPs is is activated. They keep tracks of which hard forks are activated, right? Um, and like you could probably create a mapping from that, uh, but I, I, I doubt that happens for London. But right now, if you wanted to like easily expose some data, you could say, you know, does GET have London enabled? But then on the wallet side, you need to have like some mapping that tells you, well, London is actually 1559 and Berlin is actually 2930. Yeah. yeah. I don't really think that would help basically the, the forks yeah. because there are so many chains out there and, and they don't go around yeah. these forks in, in the combination. Yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, like it, it could be done, but what I'm saying is like, it's not going to be an easy thing for client to implement. And, and, and so I don't think it's possible for, for London. Yeah. All right. And yeah. the other thing uh, was um, when implementing 1559, like access list is currently uh, on the end. And it would make it nicer if access list is basically before the gas limit, because then you could share a little bit more code. Like in the RP. Um, and currently, uh, like access list is basically on the end. And that makes it that you need basically um, it's it's more difference. So the code would be a little bit nicer if access list is before gas limit in the list. Is that too late to change it now? Or I just noticed does that, does that impact make the consensus? code nicer? Like, does that impact how the transaction is in? If it impacts how the transaction is encoded, then the answer is yes. Yeah, it impacts. Uh, how the transaction is encoded there. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think we can do any consensus changes now for London. Yeah. All right, thank you for the info. Yeah, um, and there's a question in the chat about ETH gas price. I'm actually not quite sure how it's been implemented. I don't know, like client, if you know, if you have a mic. The the only way that I implemented it was I, I look at the last base fee for the block and I said, you know, just a pretty naive, uh, fee cap for the transaction is two times the last base fee. And that can be configurable with a flag to your guest client. And then for the tip, I'm just looking at what are the tips in the last block. And I look and I try and calculate what the sort of the average, uh, the median tip is in that uh, set. And then I return that. So you'll have a very high chance of being included in the next block or two. Sorry, but what are we doing? So are you modifying the existing ETH gas price endpoint? Or is that going to maintain on the legacy um, gas GPO calculator? Right now I have the endpoint returning two different things depending on um, what the, the fork configuration is on the client. So if it's not 1559, it's going to continue to return just the gas price. If it is 1559, it will return the estimated tip and fee cap. Okay, so for GETH and ETH gas price specifically is a breaking change. Um, I yeah, if you're relying on gas price, it would be breaking, yeah. So every, any wallet that currently uses uh, that RPC call and still sends legacy transactions uh, will start sending with the wrong gas price because that endpoint will return the data for 1559. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, should we have two endpoints for, I, have we done that? I don't think we've done that with any other, other JSON RPC endpoints to have a 1559 specific. I, I personally, like, if we're going to maintain legacy transactions, we should probably maintain the legacy endpoint for them. Um, this is like for, I, we've had a lot of issues at Chainsafe because of uh, GPO like miscalculations and stuff due to the sampling, especially due to MEV. And I think like we should probably just not fuck with that. Uh, yeah. That my um, but yeah. 
if you if you want to keep the same endpoint, then you you can have like like a parameter that you know at least you requested the new way, and by default stay the way it is, if if it makes things easier. I'm open to whatever uh, you know consumers of uh, JSON RPC would like to do. I don't have a strong opinion. Um. Personally, I just like it to be in <laughs> before because right now, like London or not London, Berlin, like didn't have the access list or endpoint ready. Um, so it'd be nice to have this like ready well before we go. Okay. Are, are people okay with adding a new optional parameter that sort of signals I'm looking for the new 1559 information? And if not, just default to returning just the gas price? That, it breaks less code that way. I'm okay with that personally. Apologies for being naive, but what what correlation does the access list have on the um, UX and the gas list? Sorry, I was I was just making a reference to the fact that like we forgot about RPC and it's like being dealt with after the fact. And I've got users complaining that they got broken contracts and they're trying to figure out how the hell to pull it off. So I'm trying to avoid that early. <laughs> No worries, thanks. So basically, just to summarize, we add an optional parameter in ETH gas price, which specifies that you actually want the 1559 uh, style transaction, uh, the 1559 style estimation. And if you don't have that parameter, you just return the current uh, behavior. Sounds good to me. Yeah, it's a little bit messy to start kind of you know, making breaking changes through parameters, but the alternative yeah. is kind of I mean, but it's backwards compatible, which is nice. Um, yeah. And also gives flexibility to, uh, to like you guys, because you can, you can do some sort of flag configuration beforehand to understand which one you want to actually trigger. You know, if you want to trigger legacy or if you want to trigger the current one, the code changes like one if statement and maybe a flag. Yeah, that's what I just meant in, in terms of having a parameter versus another function name. Like we're starting to basically version an API by putting parameters on things. But... Yeah, also in favor. Wouldn't be too bad of an idea to actually implement it on its own. I'm I'm easy, but I know uh, there's a discussion kind of around this with Tim on an issue. Um, oh wait, no, that was something totally different. Yeah. So we only have one minute left and I just want to like hit a few things really quick before we wrap. First, thank you everybody for coming out, uh, whether it's early or late for you. Um, really appreciate it. We've got a ton of people, a um, ton of different wallet teams around the world. So again, thanks for coming and trying to resolve this stuff synchronously. Um, then a few other things. So this wallet cheat sheet, we've mentioned it a bunch of times. This is where we're trying to gather resources aimed at people like you who are working on interface layer. So please make sure to bookmark this and check it pretty frequently because we're going to be updating it with resources as people surface them or answering questions there. Um, uh, the ETH R&D Discord is where a lot of this discussion is being hashed out. So if you haven't joined there already, please join. Um, I'll grab a link and put it there unless Tim has already done it. And uh, we'd, we'd really appreciate if people could engage there. There are two 1559 channels, um, and that's where a lot of this is happening. And then, Tim, really quick, do you want to give, like, maybe people already know this, but, like, the timelines, um, tentative timelines for when this is ready? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we're going to actually confirm this on All Core Devs Friday, but assume, like, you know, this is the most aggressive timeline, so probably what you should plan for. So we suspect the first testnet will fork on June 9th. Um, so that'll be Robston. Then we would fork Gordy a week after that, so June 16th. And then we would fork Rinkeby a week after that, June 23rd. Um, assume all that goes well and you know we don't like find a, a big consensus issue. We're tentatively planning 1559 for July 14th on mainnet, um, but we want to see the first testnet go well before we actually initiate, before we actually set a block number for, for mainnet. Um, and yeah, I, it's not 100% sure that clients will be ready for the June 9th date. So it might slip like a week or two. Um, this is what we're going to be discussing Friday. But, uh, you know, 
if you want to be ready for like the most uh, yeah aggressive timeline, then uh, being ready for June 9th um, sh should be the, the goal. Um, and most, you know, I think most client teams have mentioned to me they should have a release with 1559 ready and whatnot uh, by by next week. Uh, so uh, like a, a week before the test net fork and then uh, we'll have the mainnet releases probably closer to like a month before the, the mainnet fork. Yeah. And that's it. Thanks again for everybody coming. Uh, we did record this, so we'll upload it somewhere and then send out an email uh, with sort of outcomes and links for next steps. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.